Welcome back to Random Book Club Podcast. I'm Dan Van. Today we're going to go over Chapter 8, A Road Well Taken. But first I got to introduce our co-host here, Justin Mason. How you doing, man? Dan, I'm doing great. It's awesome to be back for another episode of Random Book Club Podcast. Like you said, Chapter 8, A Road Well Taken, Book 1, The Sword of Bedwear from the Crimson Shadow series from R.A. Salvatore. This has been pretty cool so far. A fun fantasy read, not too difficult, and a book I think anybody can really get into. Uh, before we start, if it's cool, I'd like to plug some of my own projects. If Go you ahead. Don't mind. You guys can check out my fantasy series, I Will Protect You. That's what the main series is called. Book one, The Trinity of Heroes, and book two, A Grim Ultimatum, both available on Amazon right now. And if you're into anime, light novels, anything like that, be sure to check out Tokyo Lightning. Dan, let's do it. Let's do it. Chapter 8, A Road Well Taken. The summary. Oh, follow, me, yep. follow me on Wattpad, too. Jared and Justin authors. Yeah, I actually do follow them. They, they have a bunch of projects <laughs> that they don't even, they're never going to release, but it's cool to read. Jared's got some really effed up ideas that are really fun to read. So anyway, uh, Chapter 8, A Road Well Taken. Here's the summary. Uh, it begins like this. Get on your horse! Get on your horse! Oliver cried as he mounted Threadbare, holding the reins hard to keep the nervous beast from stumbling. It starts off with a banger! Right into it! I was actually going to say it starts off with a banger! The chapter starts off with a bang. With a banger. As we are right back in the action with Luthien and Oliver in desperate need of escaping the ferry. Following Oliver's lead, Luthien mounts River Dancer and prepares to make a jump over the jagged rocks onto whatever lay beyond. Oliver spurred Threadbare into motion, jumping the rocks and thankfully onto a grassy knoll. Luthien made the same jump easily, uh, but hit his face in River Dancer's mane until he confirmed that they had landed in one piece. Yeah, go ahead. This was, this was a scene, right? If you, When you actually sit down and read the scene, it's four or five paragraphs, three, four or five paragraphs. And when I actually read the scene, I had to go back and read it a couple times because I couldn't quite see it in my head. Yeah. So the scene is, here comes this dorsal whale. Here's the fairy. And when they cut the rope, the fairy becomes loose. So the waves from the dorsal whale push the fairy up and towards the rocks. So they're running up the side of this fairy, like jumping off of it trying to clear those rocks as it's crashing into the rocks. I had to read it a couple times. Yeah. And that's it. like, but it is a really, that's good a good scene. point because in the last episode, I was under the impression that they were going down the channel to like a waterfall. That's what it kind of sounded like, but that's not what it <sighs> was. Cool. They were going to cool, the though. other bank and it just so happened yeah. that the other bank wasn't at the regular ferry docking because the rope had been cut. It was going into yeah. a bunch of jagged rocks and they're just yeah. like, well, let's jump these things and, yeah, See we what happens. jump these things or we're dead. <laughs> Our horses at the very least. <laughs> so Luthien then observes the dorsal whale behind them now circling the flotsam of the wrecked ferry. Threadbare has a bloody scratch on one leg and Oliver was laid out on, on the wet grass shaking with laughter. He's like, mm -hmm. oh, that worked. Ha 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 ha. It was wonderful. You'll never kill me. No, no, no. The pair are <laughs> ecstatic but quickly get up and go when they see a small mob of men running towards them, waving tools. Yeah. Uh, there there were so in. many things. There were so many things about this scene that I liked. Right. And it's like, this was one of those chapters that I have a lot to say about just like, it seems like stupid details, but this is something that made me giggle. So they, they crash on the side, Oliver's on the ground, ah, 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 you know, and Luthien's, Oh my God, we made it, you know? And then all of a sudden they look over and they see this group of guys coming towards yep. them. It's like, it's like when you do some really crazy, stupid shit, right. And you're all high five and then laughing and celebrating. And then you look over and here comes like the cops. some people <laughs> yeah, yeah. or here come like, here comes some parents. Yeah. Right? To see, what's going, what are they doing? You know, they got their canes and their walkers yep. and their, you know, their micro scooters and stuff that they want to see what's, what all the commotion's about. That's literally what I thought of here. And I'm like, Oh my God, it made me laugh. Yeah. And they're like, you don't think they're going to give us a high five here. We, they're probably going to make us pay for this ferry. Let's buy yeah, Let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> so Bob leaves this, leaves the, uh, st this starting section with a nice little scene. And off they ran, side by side, the foppish halfling swashbuckler and his ugly yellow pony and the son of Bedwear on his glistening white stallion. It's a perfect, uh, I, don't know if juxtap I don't know if juxtaposition is the right word, but it's a perfect comparison between the two saying we have one extreme, Oliver, and we have the other extreme, Luthien. We have like, 
not bottoms of the bottom, but we do kind of have towards the bottom of the barrel with Oliver. And then we have that kind of higher class Luthien and they're just, it's like they're in it together. I love yeah. it. Uh, they, they have, um, it, it's interesting because Luthien's kind of from the beginning, almost a stereotypical fighter or swordsman. And then yeah. you meet Oliver and how he calls him a swashbuckler is a perfect example or like a perfect description of him. Perfect. He is totally is. a swashbuckle, you know? Anybody who's ever played Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, anything like that will immediately say, yep, swashbuckler. Swashbucky. Basically. The following Swash few board. days, yep, the following few days of travel were uneventful, traveling easily south through the farmlands of the mainland of Eriador. This was a really great transition and a good way to skip two to three days worth of time. Yeah, it was nice. Farmers in this region were very hospitable to them giving them food and lodging for the exchange of stories and news of the outside world. Oliver, of course, okay. taking center stage for most of the interactions. He's a storyteller. He can survive. I feel like Oliver at this point doesn't have to steal anymore. He probably could survive traveling on his stories alone. He probably could. Uh, traveling south for several days, eventually deciding to turn east and head through the passage cut into the Iron Cross called McDonald's Swath. This brings them up this brings up a conversation between the two companions of the legend that was Bruce Mack. Hey, Brucey Dan, Mack. Do we need our map for this? Um, you know what? Sure. Let's pull that out. Uh, cause this is a, this is a, I'm going to pull out my really good fancy map. It's a, it's a fancy map that comes with a fancy editing program. It's, you can't see it, but it's like Photoshop it's right. 82. I'll imagine it. So I'm going to zoom in on this because we're, so he's talking about going down south from the Diamond Gate Ferry. So here's the Diamond Gate Ferry, guys. Now we're going south from there, and then we're turning east onto McDonald's Swath. And it says it's a path that's cut through the mountains. And that confused me because when I look at this map, I see a mountain right above the word Eriador, and I see mountains at the Iron Cross. But I don't see any mountains where all the little towns, Brunigan, McDonald's Swath, selling downs. And then it hit me. It's called the Iron Cross. So why would it be called the Iron Cross if there was not a, a cross of mountains? So let's draw those in real quick. So I'm going to just choose this brush. And so here's our purple mountains of majesty. Okay. The Iron Cross. I actually, I actually can kind of see a cross symbol on my map. Okay. I can't on mine. So I'm just going to draw. Whoops. Let's go back here. You can see it. Oh, yeah. Yours is really nice. I like yours. Maybe send me a picture of that because that's really fancy. Anyway, um, I'll snap you. Yeah, so there's an iron cross of mountains. It goes across here and then down here. Then we have McDonald's Swath, and it basically cuts right through the mountains. And so they're turn they're going south from the Diamond Gate, traveling for several days. Um, it's almost almost a week, and then they turn east and they're gonna try to go through the mountains this way because they want to bypass Montfort. Uh, so th this kind of, um, it's just kind of illustrates to me that depending on what map you're looking at, you might be looking at something different. So anyway, we'll pull that away for now. We'll bring that back up later. Whoops. I zoomed in too far. Okay. So traveling south for several days, eventually deciding to turn east through the passage cut into the iron cross called McDonald's Swath. This brings up a conversation between the two companions of the legend that was Brucey e. Mack. After describing the tale of Bruce written in the blood of Cyclopians, I just added that because Bruce killed a lot of Cyclopians. Hell yeah, cuz. Luthien begins to introspect on the hatred he has towards the Brutes, drawing the distinction between his feelings in killing folk or humans versus killing the One-Eyes. He had never realized how deep seated his hate was until now. I like um, I like how Oliver is kind of poking at him back and forth a little bit, and this might be from a different section, but Oliver's just like, and now the one eyes are your friends mm -hmm. of the past. So he's just kind of like, you know, you they seem to kind of live amongst you here. Yeah. He even says in Gascony, we, we don't have, have no that Cyclopians, at least not ones that dare stick their heads out of their holes. Yep. So while traveling on a dirt path in between high stalks of wheat. 
Luthien gets pulled out of his reverie with the odd look that came onto Oliver's face. Oh, you got something. Justin, go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's fine. I'm sorry. I just have a lot to say this time. Do it. This is good. Um, so, and now the one eyes are your friends, Oliver asked. We have no Cyclopians in Gascony, he bragged. At least we have none that dare stick their ugly noses out of their dirty mountain holes. So either Oliver's telling a bullshit story here or Green Sparrow's hold isn't that strong in Gascony. I don't think it's strong at all in Gascony. I think Green Sparrow's goal is just Eriador, so, Avon. So think about that for a second. Pretoria. Yeah. Think about that for a second. So then what so then now here's we're another go thing. Get the Gaskins to come kick his ass. <laughs> we could get the Gaskins to come kick his ass, but like didn't Lou didn't um Garrus send Ethan down to Gascony to fight with the Gaskins against the Dury? Against Dury, yeah, I think so. Something so like that. they're kind of the pseudo allies, right? Yeah. So, so it's it's just kind of to help us fight Green Sparrow. Yeah. And if they don't help us fight Green Sparrow, or if they do help them fight Green Sparrow, what if Green Sparrow put a plague on them too? Maybe. Triggered. <laughs> Twiggled. I got your I, I got just... your text, by the way. Thank you for nice, sending the map. Nice. I was just thinking that though. I was like, so they don't have Cyclopians in Gaskin? I think they so do. Either... I, I think they do, so and they just fight them. Yeah, so it's they kill them immediately. Or he's maybe downplaying it. A They're little not friends. Uh, there, we can go into that a little I bit just... later because I have I have some notes about things we learned about detail. Oliver in this chapter, and one of them is a little bit more about Gascony and blah blah blah. Just a fun little detail. I it is really that... cool. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. So while traveling on the dirt path between the high stocks of wheat, as they're talking. Luthien gets pulled out of his reverie of introspection uh, with the odd look that came across Oliver's face. When he asked what it is, what it, what is it? Oliver responds, you have to learn to smell these things. And then they were ambushed by just over a score of Cyclopians. A score, remember, is 20. So just over that is 20 plus. It's a lot of Cyclopians. Some shooting arrows, some on foot with spears, and some on mounts. The two dispatch a few of the attackers, but are caught in a bad situation and start heading away. Luthien suggests they get off the road and hide in the high wheat stalks for cover. More Cyclopians bear down on them as they attempt to escape. So now we're getting even more Cyclopians, making the situation much more worse. Just as all seemed lost, a translucent field of shimmering blue light appeared on the road before them. Both Luthien and Oliver screamed in horror which just made me laugh. Like, ah! You know, they're just running for their lives yeah, on their on they, their mounts. They probably haven't seen a lot of magic or other no. things like Well, this. not in person. They may have heard yeah. stories, but... Yeah. So, thinking it was some devilish Cyclopean magic. Hell yeah, cuz. With the momentum of their hasty retreat pushing them forward, they plunged into the blue light of the translucent field, and all the world changed. That's how they ended that little section. They appeared in a dreamlike corridor of light, but as Luthien observed his surroundings, he found both himself and Oliver traveling across the ground at tremendous speeds. The corridor veered off the road and turned south off the road, traveling across a river without a splash, up a cliff, uh, up cliffs of mountains, through trees, and into a cliff face that allowed the two to pass through the rock as if it was tra as if they were traveling through water. So they describe. Like Go ahead. It's a tunnel. I could barely, I could barely follow this part. Oh, right? this part so this was, is, yeah. This was definitely this is like a some sort of, of some sort of magical uh, teleportation, some sort of magical escape spell. You just got the feeling by how Salvatore writes this, and I actually really like how he did this. But part of me was like, uh, "What is happening?" Yeah. So, like, how do you describe um, a, a teleportation spell? from the perspective of the person being teleported who doesn't know magic. And that's what he did here. So upon rereading it, like when I first read it, I was also very confused and I kind of just passed it. I was like, oh, this is the part when we go to Earth, the real world, because I at that time thought we were reading a different book. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, but rereading it again, I do like how he did it. And he, it does leave you as the reader yeah. being like, what is going on? But if you reread it again, you're probably supposed to think. Yeah. If you reread it again, they basically see a translucent field, which I imagine is just a square 
like shimmering blue light in front of them mm-hmm. on the road directly force, in front like of them. A force field, yeah. They cannot stop because they've they're moving so fast they can't veer off. They try to veer off, but they just can't, and they plunge right into it. And then once mm-hmm. he opens his eyes, he realizes the whole world is moving a lot faster than what he is used to on a horse. You know, they've been traveling for days. They kind of know what the feeling is like. He doesn't feel it's any different, but he notices he's moving much, much faster, faster speeds. And when he's looking around him, he's seeing everything pass underneath him, you know, very quickly. So you can imagine if you reread this part, basically flying over the terrain. And then when it comes to a river, they, it says we've crossed the river without a splash on us. So that's just saying you're just floating over the water, f- zipping past. So now you can imagine basically you're flying through here. He's not saying he's flying, but they're, he, he's being transported in this way. And it's almost like a tunnel system that's winding, going up mountains, stuff like that. And the part that really does confuse you is the end. When they come to a sheer wall, just a rock mountain, and they go right through it. But they explain that as they pass through it, he feels a little pressure on his chest, almost like it doesn't say like he was going through water. I added that because that's what I imagined if they went through a wall. So to traveling over terrain um, through through a spell is probably one thing. But actually going through a solid object is probably an entirely different feeling and probably requires a lot of magic. So anyway... Which we find out in the next chapter, it in fact does. Yes. The chapter ends as Oliver and Luthien Luthien realize that they have landed safely inside a torch-lit cave. The way they had entered was completely closed off by a wall of rock. Oliver looks at the solid rock wall from where they had entered incredulously. He's like, uh, looking at that. And then turning to Luthien for a final comment. I do not want to know. (laughs) Because, Because here's the thing. I don't want to know, man. At this at this point, how much knowledge of magic do these two really have? Probably maybe, like you said, folk stories, right? Yeah. yeah. So now they're, they're basically moments away from getting overtaken by these Cyclopeans. Think about this. Now They, they could have died. Said, yeah. And whoever this is that brought them here is strong enough to save them from certain death. Mm-hmm. So if they save them from certain death, they're powerful. Yeah. So you can just tell Oliver's like, I don't even want to know. Yeah, uh, he, he's yeah, he's beside himself. Okay, no, we made it. Whatever. I don't want to know. Don't, don't tell me. Um, and I think the reason why he... Okay, I imagined in my head that through this, Luthien was looking around, but Oliver had his eyes shut the entire time. You yeah, know? me too. So me too. when he arrives in some cave that has no exit, and he looks at the wall where they came in from, where he felt the pressure, he's like, I don't even want to know what happened, dude. Don't even tell me. My mind can't comprehend that right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I agree. It's like that episode of Star Trek when they go to that one planet where everybody's in the Renaissance times and then he nice. beat and then Picard mm-hmm. beams up one of the people and they're like, You guys are gods. And he's like, We're not gods, we just have higher technology. Before you, where were people living? And she's like, In caves and, and he's like, So, you know, if one of those people from caves came to your cities and towns, what would they say? They would probably think we're gods too. That's exactly right. So it's like kind of a similar thing where Oliver's like, I don't want to know. This is beyond my brain. I'm good mm-hmm. just where I'm at. This was a good chapter. This was this was a chapter. This was what you were going to call a inter a, a intermediate chapter, right? This is yeah. a world building chapter. This isn't a, this isn't a, anything like that. This is an intermediate chapter. This connects the 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 uh, the barge scene to the mage. That's how he connects these two and gets them there quickly. This chapter is only what five or six or seven pages. This is a very quick way to get them from the barge scene into Brindamore's cavern. Um, so I actually like this chapter. It's really good writing, and uh, it's interesting enough that it kept me interested. And it was short enough that as an interlude, it serves its purpose and it doesn't bore me and bog me down. I liked it. Yeah, there's some points I want to bring up about it too. So first, uh, the title or the <laughs> title, the chapter the title, the chapter title. I have thoughts on it. A road well taken by Robert Salvatore. Does that ring any bells for you? Keeping it um, frosty. He's keeping it frosty over there. Uh, a road well taken. There's a there's a poem by Robert Frost. Yeah. Called a road not taken. Oh. 
Uh, Two roads diverge probably, in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. Long I stood, it's, it's looking probably, down one as far probably, as I could. So I thought. It's probably a reference. So I thought, you know, a road well taken by Robert Salvatore. Bob, love the shout out. You, hey man. Hey. Hey, Bob, uh, ran a book club podcast here, Justin hey. and Dan. Just want to ask you a question if that was on purpose. You remember us. That's a good question. We you're, should ask you're him on the show all the, You're on the show all the Of time, course Bob. it was on purpose. He's Bob. He you're doesn't right do anything understand. half-assed. Exactly. He goes full ass on everything. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> now. Puts his whole ass into it. <laughs> the next point I want to bring up, explosive chapter open. This is one of those chapter opens that if you've stopped reading after the last chapter, you are immediately excited to start reading this session. When, you, when you're when you introduced on, get on your horse, get on your horse, and the action just starts. So it and immediately gets you like, oh, dude, I'm back in the book. You know what I mean? I did I did a barge scene right into this chapter. I did not stop. So here's the next part. But if you had continued reading from the last chapter, it feels like a great payoff for continuing on to the next chapter. It's the best of Absolutely. both worlds. You could, you could have stopped after the barge on the cliffhanger. Yep started up and felt great about it. But if you were like, you know what? I got a little extra time. This chapter doesn't look too long. Let's start it. Boom. You're right back in it. It feels like, dude, I was rewarded for continuing. You're right. You're right back into a banger. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Loved it too. Okay. Writer techniques. And this is going to be, um, I'm going to have to talk to you a little bit about those. Jobs. Okay. Writer techniques on growing character relationships. Christ. So in this chapter, <laughs> the thing I'm the worst at, well, Maybe we can learn something from Bob here. And I use I use sex a lot to grow my character relationships. <laughs> yeah, it goes from who are you to wall banger screw, episode one. It goes, from, it goes from who are you to screw are you. Oh boy. Oh boy. So instead of going through every detail of building a bond between Luthien and Oliver, yeah. Bob just speeds up time for about a week and just says that over this amount of time they grow closer. This yeah. lets the reader imagine all the little things that occur when you first meet an acquaintance that turns into a great friend. So I yep. really liked how he did this here. You know, you mentioned that it's a short chapter that gets you from point A to point B, but it also what he's like, what can I do with this chapter? They need to get to this point so that they can meet this wizard. So what can I do? Well, I'll throw in uh, an ambush. That's going to happen. But I want to do a little bit of introspective introspection with Luthien and let's learn a little bit more about Oliver and get them to be friends now. So how do we do that? Well, uh, they traveled south a couple days with no issues. During that time, when you travel with your friends, if you're on a road trip or you're hanging out in study hall or whatever you're doing, you're going to be just chatting it up. And you get to know, oh, you like that too? Dude, I love it when blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? So all those little things that add up to becoming a really close friend with somebody are details that you don't really think about. Like if I think about um, you and I, for instance, I don't remember all the little details that brought us so close together, but I know that we have a great bond and it only can occur with time spent together. What yeah. Salvatore does in this chapter is establishes time that's spent together so that when they are quipping back and forth in a friendly manner, um, it's believable. Yeah, they've spent the time. It doesn't feel foreign. It doesn't feel no. like you, you meet a character one day, your adversaries, you're not friends. One is a thief. One is a not a hoity-toity, but one is a little bit more straight and narrow. And there's absolutely no way in hell those two would see eye to eye, especially in Luthien's case with Oliver. But if you give them some time to travel together and learn about each other and have experiences together, which we see here, which is a really good writing technique that he passed time so subtly, very well done, uh, which we see happening in this chapter here, it's not unthinkable that these two characters could easily become closer. Yeah. Yeah. He does two time passes in this, um, in this chapter where he initially off the, after the, um, escape from the ferry, uh, they, he says a couple of days passed with no, nothing interesting happening. They just traveled South. So, you know, it's been a couple of days and then he explains the area a little bit. He says, we're in the farmlands and the farmers here mm -hmm. are really nice. So now we got a little bit of world building. Here's the thing, though. It, it, it sets like uh, we talk about this all the time, right? With the scene before Garth Rogar gets killed, there's a funny, playful, comedic uh, feel to it, right? Even the fight with Garth Rogar, there's kind of a fun, like, back and forth. Yeah. It's like too, too big. It's like Hulk Hogan and The Rock get, hitting each other with big right hands, talking shit during the match, right? Like, you know, neither of them's going to die, <laughs> but it's just, it was just, it was fun, right? It was an atmosphere. Yeah, but and what if after have... The Rock and Hulk Hogan, Hollywood Hulk Hogan, fought each other yeah. a cyclopean like came out of the corner and shot, shot him with a crossbow Hogan, 
yeah, I would have been heartbroken. So what a heel turn. Point, but my point is that right? Triple so H did have, that. Yeah. So you have the setup, right? You you have the you have this whole um, you have this. It's it's the atmosphere. It's the general atmosphere, right? Fun, easygoing, no fights, no problems. Two to three days, four days of just simple riding the horses, going through the farmlands. People are kind and nice, letting, telling stories, having a good time, just kind of laid back and chill. And he communicates that atmosphere with all the details of the land, of the farmers, of the fact that there's no confrontation, there's no issues. He does it so well, and that's why it's so well written. Yeah, he brings up, um, he first brings up that over the the couple days that they spend together, they grow closer as friends or whatever. Then he explains mm -hmm. they're in the farmlands and the farmers are really uh, friendly and that they let them eat and stay in the stables just for awesome. stories and news of the world. And then they, he goes on to say Oliver takes control of a lot of these interactions because he loves to tell stories of which Luthien believes is like, I think I wrote it in here somewhere in our notes here, but is is like three parts bullshit and one part truth so luthien is yeah. learning about oliver through these storytellings and it's obviously just entertaining the farmers they don't give a crap you know but they're it, it's it's a good way to first establish they've become closer as friends well how did they do that like you can just say someone's become closer how do you do that well you're spending time together sleeping in stables laughing about the cow that just farted next to you you know what i mean just stupid yeah. stuff you can imagine yeah. it's it makes a setting for those little scenes that you imagine in your head as the reader. I'll give you a great example of an anime that does this. Uh, I don't mean to go on the jump on the isekai anime train, but Konos <laughs> don't Kona but Konosuba does this really well. You have Aqua, the goddess, and you have, uh, oh, Christ, Kazuma, I think, the main character. He gets transported to another world, and he says, hey, I want to take you with me. And they're not friends at the start. She, she's like, she makes fun of him. She shits on him. She trashes him all the time. And they pass like two to three weeks right away through like a working and making money montage and all of a sudden at the end of it they're like good friends like they're working together they're trying to figure this out so they can both get out of this world right but my point is the the use of the passage of time as a technique to build a bond between characters whether it's in film media animation media or even writing media depending on how you do it is really effective if yeah. you do it right another anime that they do that pretty well in is cowboy bebop Yep. Where each episode is kind of standalone, where any amount of time could have passed in between yeah. the, each episode because they're all based on jobs. And then sure. they'll start an episode where Spike is basically working out or like playing chess with uh, Jet. And they're just having a banter back and forth and reminding each other of, of crap that happened before. He's like, you haven't paid the rent. You haven't paid the repair bills. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you can tell this is an argument that has happened a thousand times. You know, so it, it puts in your mind, okay, they're at a certain level because they've already experienced this stuff that doesn't happen on the screen. But we can tell. We can intuit it. Okay, that was cool. So, next part. Why the question hate for Bob. Not question yet. for Bob. Well, maybe. Oh. Maybe it's a question for Bob. It's a question for the book, really. Why the hate towards the Cyclopeans? So before Bruce put them down, apparently they had committed many atrocities against the people of the land, even organizing to raid villages and farmlands. These stories have been passed down and may be part of the reason why Ethan left the arena after Green Sparrow started distributing the One-Eyes across the kingdom. Did you get that little bit there? In this, in this they talk about so. when he, they're talking about the legend of Bruce McDonald, who had an army, E I E I O. E -I -O. Uh, they say that the reason why that they did this, or the reason why Bruce was trying to rid the land of the One Eyes, was because of all the atrocities that the Cyclopeans had done. So these stories, then he says, these were the stories that Luthien was brought up with. Garrus was telling him, you know, the guards were telling him all these stories of the Cyclopeans. This is why we train, blah, blah, blah. So then when Green Sparrow takes power and then starts distributing Cyclopeans as personal guards to everybody, and as we know, it's probably spies, and I, you know, keeping an, keeping an eye on the situations out there. God, that's just genius writing. Um, he says that's when Ethan got out of the arena. So I wonder why Ethan got out of the arena there. Was it because he had so much built-in hatred against the Cyclopeans that even if they were just practice fighting, he would probably try to kill them? 
Or was he trying to hide his prowess from the eyes of Green Sparrow? Because if they saw how good Ethan was, if he is truly as good as we think, would that not create a little like red flag for the agents of Green Sparrow being like, hey, man, up in uh, Dunvarna, they got this arena over in Isle, uh, over in the bed bedwares area. Dude, that kid is good. We need to either get him as a knight or get him to say goodnight. You know what I'm saying? Well, maybe he's smart. You know, Ethan, Ethan this whole time feels like he's hiding something. Uh, you know, obviously he's not happy, but, you know, he feels like maybe he's holding something back. We, we get that whole that whole character comes through with Ethan, like he's holding back from just just unloading on his father or just really just being like, Luthien, you dumbass. Like, you know, like he's just like, come on, kid, get it together. You know what's up. Like he's he it just feels like he's holding himself back. And honestly, I I wonder. And so. for a character who is not in the story at all, I really enjoy these little bits where they just throw in Ethan's name. Even if it doesn't mean anything when Bob's writing it, it makes it feel like, oh, Ethan is still in this world. We still have, have a you? goal. We're trying to get to Ethan. So that is our goal. Writing that's a really good writing technique. And what that does is it reminds you that Ethan is still a person. Mm -hmm. He's still a, he's still a relevant thing in this story. He's just not showing up in this book. But by mentioning him maybe every other chapter or so, you don't forget about him. It's a great way to remind your reader of characters in the story without giving them a whole chapter. Next up, injury report. We had some injuries this chapter. Let's go over them. Threadbare, the Mount of Oliver de Burroughs. Is he a, dead yet? No, he's not dead. He's a, He yeah. was intelligent in this chapter and did uh -huh. some front kicks against the Cyclopeans to, boom, back it off, distract them. You know what I'm saying? Before, whoosh, he's a war horse, bro. He's, he's a, a war horse. So he gets a bloody cut on the jump off the ferry over the jagged rocks in the beginning of the chapter. But it's nothing right. serious, but he's bloody. He's got a bloody leg. Okay, River Dancer, Luthien's favored horse. Took an arrow in the rump during the Cyclopean ambush on the road, causing his stride to stumble a bit. This is unacceptable. Bummer. Luthien gets nicked on the shoulder during the ambush by an arrow. And um, last but certainly most important, Oliver's hat. Luthien no. looked over at Oliver and nearly laughed aloud, seeing no. an arrow sticking through the halfling's great hat. No. Rip Oliver's glorious headwear. This is unacceptable, dude. <laughs> The arrow went right through it. Ruined the entire book for me. <laughs> I loved it. Character when this happened. <laughs> I loved it. It was so stupid. Uh, I'm like, come on, Bob, really? man. Come on, Bob. <laughs> Why you gotta do it like that? <laughs> you, you know, you're, he's going over. Everyone's getting hit. The the horse got nicked in the bum. Back of like, yeah. Luthien's shoulder. Luthien's <laughs> shoulder. You're like, and then he looks over at Oliver. It's like, what happened to Oliver? It, arrow through his through his hat because he's because remember now can you imagine hey, think about this for a second what if oliver was man-sized oh he, he would have been there. dead headshot he'd have, the, he'd have to go through the chest bro headshot bro <laughs> chest shot headshot. all right moving on to places of note travel log pull up the map travel log, travel log. so oliver and luthien <laughs> land on the Ariador mainland which is directly east of the southern tip of dunvarna so we're looking on the north middle of the map, and that's where Ariador is. So kind of over by this Rob Wynn or whatever that is called. So they is travel it south. Ariador or is it Ariador? Oh, oh, oh my god! <laughs> oh man! I know, dude. I'm just. Oh. I'm I'm ruining the podcast tonight. No, that's okay. I I had written down the the narrator's name, and I I keep forgetting it. But he's a very good narrator, besides maybe some of the things that he chooses to creatively change. Anyway. Without looking. Without looking. So they travel south for a few days and then decide to veer east onto McDonald's Swath. So they travel south for a few days and get all the way down to McDonald's Swath. So it was very easy traveling, as they say. But from Dunvarna to Diamond Gate was like almost three days. Uh, it took them two days, right? So then if that amount of space, <laughs> you know, we're going deep on the map here, boys, but if that amount of distance is like two days, then they travel for a couple days. They, 
I guess they could get to McDonald's Swath if a couple days means four. Mm-hmm. Three or four. Yeah, it's a, you know, I, I'm looking at the distance between Dunvarna, or even Hale, and the Diamond Gate Ferry, and I'm putting that distance in there. That's It's about right. Okay. So, between two and four days, it's about right, depending on travel conditions. They said it was comfortable travel conditions. That's the weather true. was good, and the farmers were kind. Yep. So they decided to veer east through McDonald's Swath, a path carved into the Iron Cross by Bruce himself in an effort to make travel easier for folk when they were at war with the Cyclopeans. According to the tales, Bruce McDonald cut the swath through the mountains, thus crossing more easily and gaining a surprise on the main Cyclopean force, who did not expect his army before the spring had cleared the mountain passes. And then we learn a little bit about Gascony, our boys to the south. Oliver explains that there are no Cyclopeans in Gascony. At least we have none who dare to stick their ugly noses out of their dirty mountain holes, like you mentioned. Two questions. Actually, one question. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is there a possibility that there could be an entire Cyclopean race in Gascony that is only, that's subterranean, that only lives below ground, that is yet to be really recruited for war? Because there could be an entire subset of people that Luthien could recruit to fight Green Sparrow. I know that's going deep. That is not confirmed lore in this book. That is my own thoughts and my own questions. That... And I apologize if I confuse anybody. So that's the first question. What's your second one? I think that was my only question. Okay. My other question would be my other question would be What would uh, that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like okay, what so what would that if... mean for the book's lore? What would that mean for the entire yeah. world's lore? That you know, that's a really you know, I'm glad you brought that up because that is an interesting dive on this is why we do this, dude. I love this kind I, of conversation. Why do I think that stuff? Because, because he like, said you know, it because in the book he says, at least not any who decide to stick their dirty noses outside their dirty mountain holes or whatever. So you're thinking, yeah. Oh, so they live of yeah, they, underground only. Yeah. So that could be. And maybe they're in in league with maybe some underground dwarves or or uh, gnomes or something like that, and they work together. And there's a whole new story underneath about the gnomes underneath Gascony, because here is, in Eriador we got you know the fair folk or whatever the what are they called the again? Fairborn. 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 We got dwarves. We haven't heard anything about gnomes. We haven't heard anything about like Drugar, Durgar, whatever the underground dwarves are. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So that's cool. I like that. That's a good thought. Okay, fauna. Well, no we got secret it. Yeah, dude, tell me. Wait, just between us. Just between you want no between us. You want, no, you want no secret? Okay. Can I tell? There's can an, I tell my wife? There's, there's an entire race of cyclopians waiting to fight. Oh, oh, dude. Not, not, not confirmed. Okay, don't. All right, I'll keep a secret between you and me. Fauna. Right, We've got a new creature. Pony what? pigs. Ugly. Yeah, what's up with Ugly but muscular beast that looked like a cross between a shaggy horse and a wild boar. Some of the Cyclopeans that ambush Oliver and Luthien on their way to McDonald's Swath were riding these things. Although pony pigs can easily can be easily outrun on clear ground, these grunting Cyclopean mounts can plow through brush better than any creature. So, back when they were running away, Luthien suggests, "Let's go into the the tall wheat. Uh, you know, let's go into the long grass." You know, don't go into the long grass. What is this, Lost World? Oh, raptors. Well, we don't have raptors in this world, but we do have pony pigs who can go yeah, through that crap pigs. like nobody's business. Yep. See, because they're because they're hardy. They're hardy. And for, for some element. reason, for some reason, even though there are no cyclopians or whatever that Oliver deals with, he does know enough about pony pigs to tell Luthien that ain't gonna work. They better in the in the tall grass. Maybe he was lying. Oh, dude. And in the next chapter, we're going to find out he's lying. 75% bullshit, you 25% were, truth. And you were exactly correct on your thoughts last chapter where you're like, I'm 50-50 on Oliver right now. I think he's hiding a lot. Well, who, chapter 9, we we about to see some more. Anyway, let's get this out of the way. Uh, special people, Oliver's character insights. We learn that Oliver, even though a thief, holds himself up to very high principles, only stealing from merchants and nobles. He also is reluctant to kill anything, unless it's Cyclopeans. We also learn that Oliver came from, came to Eriador on a ship that left him on the road to Montfort. Maybe I do need the map for that. Not really, but on the road to Montfort. So Montfort's right over here. So wherever he came from Gascony, traveled up. On the right side of Baraduin, said hi to the the Fairborn, and then stopped right here on the road to to Montfort. And he didn't want to go there for some reason, or maybe he did, and for whatever reason, he doesn't want to go back. 
So we learned a little bit about Oliver there. Bruce McDonald. Luthien describes some of the legends by explaining the name of the passage that was taken through the mountains, McDonald's Swath. It's interesting to me because it expands on Bruce's legend in a couple of ways. So follow me on this. I got a couple of ways, three ways that I want to bring up. Now, is this is this confirmed lore or is this Dan diving deep? It's both. Okay, go ahead. So he explains the lore of McDonald's Swath is what he calls it. First, that he had the foresight and strategy in cutting a passage through the mountains to beat down the Cyclopeans that weren't expecting them until the spring due to treacherous mountain passes. I think that's awesome. Bruce was a wonderful leader. You know, he had the the idea, let's just cut through the mountains. They won't expect us. I think that's awesome. So that gives us a little introduction, not an introduction, more insight into Bruce as the legend as he was, why he was so popular. It shows ingenuity in that you have to have a fairly good planning Fairly good planning and equipment to get through mountains. If you're going to cut a path through mountains, you're going to need to plan that out, have tools ready, blah, blah, blah. So I can only imagine the stories that could be told from the reaping of Bruce's swath through the Iron Cross. And lastly, I worded my imaginary Bruce story like that because the reaping of the swath, because those terms are both relate to harvesting. The name of the trail is McDonald's swath. A swath is defined as a row of cut grain or grass left by a scythe or mowing machine. So these, this path through the mountains is called McDonald's swath, as if the mountains themselves were some sort of grass that Bruce cut through, right? So the legend of Bruce McDonald just continues to build in the name of this path. He not only rid the lands of the Cyclopeans, but cut a path through mountains to do so, like a scythe through a wheat field. The folk in this region are all farmers, so most likely it was farmers who helped him cut the path, and it would be farmers who told the tales, which is why it's called McDonald's Swath. Is that too deep for you? Yes, that's why. I I love you, dude. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Here's the thing. It's I tell you this every time. It's why I love this podcast, and it's why I'm so passionate about doing this with you. Because it's first of all, it's I never even thought of that. Never thought of it. Did you know what a swath I was? I didn't. I know. I have to like look up cut, things cut, all the you time. You cut a swath. You cut a swath. You cut a big, big swipe with your weapon. It's called cutting a swath. They use I didn't it know in that. Fantasy books all the time. But my point is, that's what I love about this. Right? Is you have different. You take things differently than I take things. I take things differently. Then you take things. Yeah. And we bring both of this stuff to the table. Dude, so cool. And I want a graphic a cool novel. I want a graphic novel about the reaping of the Iron Cross. <laughs> now, what a Bob, great title. If you, Bob, if you do that, we want royalties for the suggestion. You know what? I don't need royalties, but I will. I would I love to help you with the story because yeah, I have some oh, ideas yeah. of some really cool farmers being like, legendary in themselves so bruce is the ultimate people's champion being able to take down the enemy with a bunch of hardy farmers to back him all right he's the ultimate he's the ultimate what people's champion do you smell what bruce mcdonald is cooking what was he called the great unifier or something like that bruce mcdonald the the unifier the people's champion bruce mcdonald he's going through the iron cross (laughs) <laughs> he's got the swath <laughs> is this just is all the names on this map just a bunch of wrestling moves fantasy wrestling moves I swear to God, the dude. iron cross carlisle on stratton <laughs> um okay whatever okay questions for bob bob salt salt wash <laughs> yeah hey bob rbc podcast bob, here you right remember us podcast. from last episode questions. you hang out with us all the time bob you remember us just start tweeting him on Twitter. See if you can get him on here. <laughs> Does he have a Twitter? Maybe I need to make no, a Twitter. All, all the authors have Twitters, dude. Okay. Where do you get your I'm ideas for creatures and animals in your books? You write new beasts like pony pigs with such confidence that I, as the reader, accept them immediately and move on with the story, knowing that there could be other beasts in the world that I do not know of. Do you it's keep so a? True. Yeah. Do you keep a document or files of notes? Um, as you write your stories and how do you organize them so that if you wanted to recall a past event or creature, you could find it easily. Those are my questions for Bob. Here's the thing, man. It's so cool the way he does it, right? Because his bestiary is pretty strong and it's pretty thorough. When you're reading this, I hear pony pig. You know exactly what that is. I immediately think like big tusked, fast running 
large size pig like you see in anime movies yep. or like maybe maybe like you'd see in like princess mononoke or something yeah i immediately am like of course yeah that's i can it. already see what i know what this creature looks like i don't need to sit here and dwell on it all day i don't need a big fat picture in my face yep i like the description on. of it I, I had already read the description of it when we introduced oh. it in fauna but it's yeah. short sweet it's one sentence it lets you know what's up and then you move on and he does it in such a good way that it's like how do you do that without making it sound stupid? Like pony pigs, pony pigs sounds stupid, but when it's coming from an attack from Cyclopians who we've established as very real threats to Luthien at least, and then you got 20 plus of them and half of them are riding these pony pigs, it starts to get scary. And then when you find out that they can go through the tall grass, like nobody's business. Now it's like, Oh, these are, this is a real thing. Okay. So that's chapter eight. Uh, we're at 45 minutes. Are you willing to sit around for another 20 to do chapter nine or should we save it? I think, you know, I'm looking through chapter nine, Dan. Chapter nine's small. Longer. Yeah, but it's longer than chapter eight. Is it? Dude, yeah. I got way less. I got way less written for chapter nine All than right. I did for chapter All eight. All right. Y'all get Let, a treat. Let's run we're it. doing chapter nine. Okay. Let's, we're doing it. Well, extra special extended episode. It's an extended episode. Random Book Club Podcast, the extended edition for you 18 plus viewers after 9 p.m. Here we go. <sighs> Chapter 9. Brind Amor. Amor. Summary. This this title, before we even read the first word after the end of the last chapter, this title, Brind Amor, made me think, hmm, mage. That made me think, name of the name of the cave system. Like, they landed okay. up in a cave. I'm like, this is a place called Brindamore, like the Battle of Evermore. You know what I mean? But it obviously is. You are correct. The chapter begins with a description of the natural cave that Luthien and Oliver found themselves in. With a table full of parchments and scrolls, gargoyle paperweights, inkwells, vials, and long feathery quills, it was obvious to the pair that they were in a wizard's private chambers. Within the first two paragraphs, I know exactly where we are. I've it's seen awesome. this in movies. I've seen this in comics and manga. Classic anime wizardry. Anime and video games. You know it immediately. Cautiously, they dismounted and began to get their bearings. Luthien inspected Riverdancer's rump. We got to check on Riverdancer, dude. He's fine. He was shot in the butt. As, Riverdancer's as rump. Sno Go ahead. As Jon Snow would say, he'll heal. <laughs> Winter came and left. He'll heal. River Dancer's rump where the arrow had luckily only grazed the horse. Thank goodness. We didn't know because we were escaping. It only grazed. So it looked like it wouldn't be a serious wound. All uh, Real quick. Yep. Go. Flexing my knowledge. Flexing my knowledge. Uh, when I go deer hunting, I bow hunt. Shooting a deer in like in one side of the butt, like like the left or the right side of the, I think it would be where the sirloin comes from. Yep. Um, that is a good spot to shoot a deer. Because there's main veins and arteries there that will kill you if you cut them. So I definitely can see where uh, Luthien would be concerned over. Very concerned. Shot here because had he taken a barbed bolt, which comes from a crossbow, had he taken a barbed bolt here, very easily could have killed his horse if it dug deep enough and punctured one of those veins or arteries. Because they don't have that technology to fix that in this time. But no. luckily, Just they, were, they were Cyclopeans, dog. Stinky one eyes, dude. Yeah. Sniffer. Easy. Barnyard animals. Oliver yeah. made a beeline to the immense desk with many cubbies and shelves. Luthien Start warned him. <laughs> Luthien warned him Start. to be careful. He's like, see ya. <laughs> yeah, Luthien's going, oh, Start. River Dancer, you're good. Threadbearer, your leg's looking okay now. And Oliver, what the heck are you doing? Oliver's like <laughs> putting little <laughs> trinkets in himself. Everywhere. <laughs> Luthien warned him to be careful in the chamber because he had heard many tales of dangerous wizards. So we learn a little bit that, of course, they that's how they learn about wizards. He yeah. reasoned that a wizard who could cast a tunnel of travel like the one that they had that had spirited them the pair away was probably a very powerful magician. Mm -hmm. Luthien then found a crystal ball that showed the entire room with the horses and them in it, kind of like a security camera. Oliver pocketed a vial from the desk, and the two started arguing when they heard <laughs> they, they argued about it. He's like, "Dude, the wizard saved us." He's like, "I know." It was great of him. And he's it was very nice of him. Yep. That's mine. That's mine. <laughs> you can have this one. <laughs> and, but the way that he writes it, he actually doesn't put he doesn't put many vials in himself. We only 
as the readers see that he has taken one, one yeah. vial uh, from the desk. So damn funny. And they started arguing when they heard a disembodied voice say, your gratitude is appreciated. Then appeared an old man out of the rocks. He had he was he had a camouflage himself to observe, observe them without startling them and also to protect himself. The old man doesn't reveal his identity, but reveals his knowledge of the two by name and special details, revealing Oliver's true name as Burrow. Oliver Burrow. Burrows. Yeah, I think it was an S. Oliver Burrows, who and calls not, himself Oliver de Burrows. Yes. And that Luthien's father misses him dearly. Garrus. My heart goes out to you, G-Man. Sorry, bro. The wizard. Pounding that, he's pounding that spy right now, but he misses you, bro. So then at this point, the wizard does a really funny thing with Oliver where he's like, um, can I have my vial back? And Oliver's like, of course. My bad. Here's the uh, here's the vial. And he's like, it seems like you had um, more than one. And he's like, I, I always keep a spare <laughs> and gives him another one. And he's like, it seems like you have quite a bit. And then he's like, fine. Boom, there's the real one. <laughs> I loved it. It was it so was, good. I, I was, when I was reading this, I was legitimately snickering to myself. Yep. I'm like, funny shit. <laughs> the wizard then goes on to tell them that he has observed them for a while and believes them to be resourceful and courageous, which are just the two qu- characteristics he requires. After reclaiming the stolen vial from Oliver, he offers the pair passes into Montfort and information that might keep them alive once they are there in return for their service. Luthien asks to go into detail of this favor the wizard is asking for, but the old man insists they discuss it over dinner. Over roasted duck, several exotic vegetables, fine wine, and clear cold water, the conversation turned to the task of the wizard. The old man explains that he had lost something valuable, and it's somewhere in the sealed cave complex not too far from where they are now. He continues to describe that the cave was sealed 400 years ago by him and some wizard buddies that are long dead. Brindamore, oh, then, so I wrote Brindamore here. So uh, I think at this point, Luthien says, I'm not going to do anything for you unless you tell me your name. And so he's like, all right, yeah. fine. Well, okay, Luthien, he kind of fronts a little bit and goes, you know what, dude? Yeah, you saved us. That's great. But I'm not going to do a task for you. This is sounding sketchy. I don't even know your name. So then Brindamore introduces himself, explains that they need to get a staff that was stolen from him and placed in the sealed cave not so long ago. The cave was sealed to keep the inhabitants in. The old man claimed it was the king of the Cyclopeans and his mightiest of warriors. Luthien and Oliver weren't really buying it, but they let the wizard continue. He explained that since he he explained that since he is old and weak, he cannot retrieve the staff himself, but that uh, when they complete the task, they will be rewarded and well paid. After dinner concluded, with the wizard offered them time to sleep, saying that they would start in the morning. The two checked on their horses and discussed the odd nature of the task and their concerns. Luthien began to realize that he was now well out of his own path, which is well out of his own path to his brother Ethan, and also realized that the world is truly vast. That's do the we chapter. Know, do we know specifically at this point where they are? Yes. Or do we just know they're in a cavern? Well, we kind of know. Because, okay, so this is what happened. I don't. I can't erase everything here. Let's do that. Okay, so they were at. They were just turning onto McDonald Swath. Then they got spirited away, uh, going south, and then they went over a river, and they went over a mountain, and then, um, then they just kind of landed somewhere in a cave. I imagine since he's offering them passage into Montfort, that they're near Montfort, but in the in the in the mountains of the Iron Cross. Okay. So I just kind of imagine they're up in some really hard to access place near Montfort. Does that make sense? And yeah. obviously no one's getting in because it's all sealed off. Not just the the cave complex that the task is about, but where they are at. They went through a solid wall to get there. Whether that's an imaginary wall or a real I think it's a real wall because they had experienced pressure when they went through it as opposed to their regular travel across the water across the fields across the mountaintops so some points to bring up Brenda Moore the subtle is what I'm naming him the nice. wizard the wizard is obviously very powerful and not telling the whole truth but he seems to be trustworthy at this point he catches all yeah, he could have just killed, he could have just killed them both straight up 
and he could have he could have let them die because there's a point when Oliver's like, I could have killed those filthy one eyes myself. And then he's like, Open okay, thing, go back. It's only been a few minutes, dude. I bet you they're still hanging around. You want to turn around? And he's like, uh, here's your vial. So he I catches <laughs> he catches Oliver trying to pull a fast one when he retrieves his vials back from the halfling. Also, he uses a spell and he uses his spells and body language to subtly hint at the power dynamic between him and the two friends. When Luthien begins to press Brindamore too hard by saying, I don't even know your name and blah, 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 uh, with questions at dinner, the wizard magically ignites his pipe and takes his time to begin to speak, subtly showing Luthien, hey, man, I'm a wizard. Look, man, I'm a wizard. Okay. And in this case, <laughs> I'll your shit up. Okay, bro. Dude, I'm a wizard. Okay. Th- this is. I don't have to tell you nothing. I am. Dr. Brindamore. Okay. Let's get that straight. <laughs> he does he's actually nicer than that. He's nicer than that. He doesn't say, I'm a call me wizard. Wiz Brindy. You know, he doesn't call say that. Me, call me a Mage Brindamore. Yeah. Of the third uh, Brindamore, uh, sir. Uh it's Mage Brindamore, to which I would respond with a slap. Yep. So I thought that was cool that this this character is likable, even though he's not telling the truth. And we can tell as the reader, he's not telling the truth. Oliver and Luthien, no, he's not telling the truth. But there's something about this that's like, <clears throat> he saved us, though. There's a reason. I think it's, I think it's on purpose, right? Maybe it's true. You know, and you, I think to myself, okay, if Brindamore is really that powerful, he could teleport into the cave, get a staff, and teleport out. So there has to be something keeping him from going there. Yeah. So it has to be. Otherwise, he would have done it himself. If he's that strong, he would have done it himself. Well, he rebuts that by saying he's too old and weak right now. Uh And and we'll get into him. We'll describe his character a little bit under special people Uh section. Next point to bring up Oliver's deception. So, Oliver de Burroughs is actually just Burroughs. Oliver Burroughs. Why would Oliver call himself by basically his real name, but add the prefix attached or like have an added prefix attached? If he was trying to hide his true identity, why not take a a different name entirely? It just also hints that without the fancy D in the beginning of his name, he's just a regular guy posing as something more. So if he truly was trying to hide himself, why not be, you know, Oliver Entrary? Or some some other exotic sounding name. Instead, he took his name and added the D in front of it. And this made me wonder, like, is his accent even real? Like, is he actually just a regular halfling? Or, you know what I mean? Is he even from Gascony? Right. So, he is Oliver Burroughs. But he calls himself De Burroughs, you know? So, it makes me also think, like, what happened to you, Oliver? Well, who hurt you, who dude? Hurt, who hurt who you? Hurt, show us where the bad man touched you, dude. No. Because it, it's like he want. It's like he's trying to elevate himself through everything. He's a highway ha- He's a highwayman, not a highway, highway halfling. Highwayman. He's a swashbuckler. He's, he's got big hats. Know. Here's the thing: I haven't actually finished this book. What if his true background is he's literally a street rat, like Aladdin was? What if he's nothing? Yeah, he's a street rat scoundrel. I don't buy that. Let's not be too hasty. Street rat, riff raff. I don't buy that. (laughs) Oh, dude, I want to sing so bad now. Um, But yeah, so it's it's uh, it's interesting. It it puts a little bit more into Oliver. Why is he telling everybody his name is DeBurrows when I mean he's obviously taking that identity on fully. He's always introducing himself. He's always saying it like that. Yeah, so you think there'd be a slip up here or there, but there's not. It would be nice to see a little bit more played with that. I like I like how the wizard calls it out. He calls out something personal about Oliver, putting him in his place. Another subtle like, hey, I'm just letting you know I know you guys. You know, he lets Luthien know um, that his father misses him. Your dad misses you. Yeah. So and that's what that's what makes me feel like I can trust the wizard. He's revealing this information in front of them, knowing that they're friends with each other. He's obviously observed them. He thinks he gives them praise about being courageous and stuff like that. So it's like, okay, I trust this guy. But then when he starts telling his task, it's like, you want me to get what? I lost something. Go get it. Why? Where is it? In a cave. Maybe maybe the Cyclopeans aren't in there. Maybe he's been sealed out of there. Well, let's talk a little bit about. Brindamore, the wizard of the sealed cave. He was 
old. As old, this is how it says it in the book. This is how they introduce him. He was old, old as Luthien's father at least, but held himself straight and with the grace that the impressive young bedweer, the, it, with the grace that impressed the young bedweer. His thick and flowing robes were rich blue in color, and his hair and beard were white, snowy white, like river dancer's silken coat, and, a flow, and flowing all about his shoulders. His eyes, too, were blue, as deep and rich as the robes, and sparkling with life and wisdom. Crow's feet angled out from their corners, from endless hours of pouring over parchments, Luthien figured. So, in this description, he seems sprightly. For an old man. He's as old as Garrus. You know, they've lived, lived two different lives, but he can tell, ah, Garrus and, and Brindamore are probably the same age. They've just led different lives. And this guy's got the wisdom and, like, he's kind of, like, still into things and figuring things out, you know? Uh, whereas Garrus... Kind he, of kind of how I would imagine you'll be at 65. Oh, yeah, dude. Really trying to figure stuff out. Minus the hair, you know? Uh, I'm already there. Okay, so... Luthien... <laughs> okay, the... The old man didn't reveal his identity to Luthien and Oliver at first, only saying that who he was was not important. Luthien eventually gets him to reveal his name as Brindamore. He is very old and has lived so long. He has lived... Uh, the reason why he's lived so long is because he's lived in what he calls magical stasis. So his magician friends are dead. But he's still alive. So he's living in magical stasis. He can't use up too much magic or he will die. So that's why he's too old and weak to go in there himself. But we can just tell by the description of him in his introduction that he is not too old and weak. We can tell by the uh, spell he cast, he's powerful and can do it whenever. So that's a that's a writing to- that's a writing technique, right? Where as the writer, you tell your reader something that your characters are not aware of because the characters are probably not um seeing they're, they're, they're not seeing the that script. detail he's they're just getting the luthien but just, they're missing little details yeah, just like you said yeah luthien looks over and he's like oh this guy looks uh old as garris but like to the that, reader yeah. it's like his eyes were sparkling blah 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 you know mm-hmm. and we're like mm-hmm. oh dude so this guy's a little smarter than he looks yeah this guy's this guy's gucci okay questions for bob nope. hey bob it's random book club podcast here again the same episode just uh you know us you hang out with us on the weekends we got some questions how do you come up with fantasy sounding names like Brindamore? Why do you put apostrophes in the name? Do you draw inspiration from other languages or something? Bob. Question mark. Bob. Quit moving your mic, dude. I can just, it's blaring in my ears. Really? Yeah. Well, it I goes, don't know that. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Well, I don't know that. It's fine. We're good now. Justin, how do you come up with names, fantasy sounding names? I literally write a name. And I'm like, does that sound fantastical enough? Like Lawrence Sanctus. Sanctus. That sounds pretty San- good. Sanctus. Sanctity. Protection. Sanctum. Uh, shield. Uh, all that stuff. Lawrence. Lawrence of Arabia. So like it's an older sounding name that people identify with. Lawrence Sanctus. Really cool. Benny. Benjamin. Benny Wakewood. Benny Hanna. Yeah. Uh, Razius. Grim. Spelled with two M's. Razius, like, come on, dude. Like, that's about as fantasy sound as you can get. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. I wish I had that talent. I have to go to fantasy name generators online, and I, d- I don't there. like half of them. I've been there. Okay, so uh, that concludes it. We did it. We did eight and nine today. Damn, dog. How do we do that? Pretty fast. I don't know. We did. We did all right. So uh, that was chapter eight and chapter nine of the Sword of Bedware. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Justin, thank you for joining me today. You guys should uh, check out his stuff. I've got the links in the description below that goes to his Amazon page. And you can check out his other works as well. They're pretty great. Um, Thanks for being on here, dude. I'm always happy to be here, Dan. Thanks for having me as part of the podcast. And um, 8 and 9 were great chapters. It kept me interested and made me want to read more. See you guys at Chapter 10 when we find out what happens to the two friends, two companions. Thank you for listening to Random Book Club Podcast.